Three, two, one, here we go. Hello everyone, I'm Brian the Rain Man Lucas. Welcome to Rain Man's Take, observations on the world we live in. We're going to take a deeper dive into topics of interest to me, including politics, current events, history, popular culture, and social issues. You'll find the diversity of topics refreshing. In our clickbait, soundbite society, we rarely get the whole story. Rain Man's Take interviews interesting people as well as peeling back the onion on specific topics all with the goal of getting people to think more deeply about a subject. Back to my interview with Bruce Jojo Laughlin. This is the uh, second of a two-part series. Uh, if you remember from last week, um, I had Bruce on because he's had a very unique uh, experience in the military, both in combat as well as uh, some of the other billets that, he's, that he had during his, uh, during his Marine Corps career. And I just thought it was fascinating. And yes, uh, last week, in our first interview, uh, we got through uh, Bruce's experiences in combat in Afghanistan right after 9-11, and then, um, and then the initial invasion in Iraq uh, in 2003, all the way up until they got into Baghdad. And so what I wanted to do once we get this thing going is I wanted to have uh, Bruce in today's conversation talk about, kind of finish up with the invasion and talk about what he did after that working his way all the way into, uh, into the build that he had at the end of his career in, in Pakistan. But what I first wanted to mention is, uh, as you can see, we're both casual. It looks like we just got off the golf course. Um, that was a request uh, by Bruce. He wanted to wear his, uh, his school colors, so he forced me to wear them as well, which is all good. So, Jojo, why don't you tell me a little bit about it, brother? Well, uh, the school needs revenue. 200 grand for an education is not enough. That is a bottom line. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I've been, uh, I've been laughing with some of these guys uh, on the, the gifts uh, section there. You know, they're, they're hustling and shaking, trying to get more money. And what yeah. you, you guys don't. Go, start at the junior college like I did. And then... Uh, so, and then so, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so... Bruce is uh, that that shirt is TCU Texas Christian, and yeah. uh, they live in Fort Worth. He he's a uh, he's a chip shot away from the campus. He got his uh, he got his MBA from there. But what I really think is the reason why he wanted to put that shirt on and have me put my shirt on is that TCU is a very high ranked uh, football team, Division One, and Hopkins doesn't even have has a Division Three football team. Great Division Three, but not Division One. So JoJo, go ahead, have at it. Well, I, if you pay your coach uh, $5 million a year, you should have a good team. Uh, that's the bottom line. I'll tell you, though, the success story around here that nobody wants to talk about is uh, the ping pong team out at Texas Wesleyan. Think about this. I think they've got like 19 national titles for table tennis. There you go. It's absolutely remarkable. It is uh, – and it's something that I'm embarrassed to talk about because it's they're just that good. Uh, but they lost their coach, and not they losers. She moved, uh, and uh, now they're suffering. They need they need a guy like me to teach them. It, it'll go back to ping pong instead of table tennis if I teach them. I love it. Hey, dude. So uh, so talk to me. Is uh, TCU are they going to be playing this year? Do you know? I anticipate that they will. Uh, I know that the students are going to come back to campus on the 10th of August. Um, I'm not really sure what the circumstances are with the schedule, but uh, yeah, you know, I, you guys should go online, look at the TCU expansion for the football uh, stadium. It, it's mind boggling. It's actually a little bit sickening, almost like the time you bought drinks for us at uh, Jerry's World. It is nuts. It, it is, it truly is. Um, and I just kind of like, what? We're, uh, it's a different world. You know, classic, classic. Well, it, you know, it's it's funny because well, not funny, just it's strange. I'm a huge football fan, and all of you out there probably assume by now because I'm from New England that I'm a huge New England Patriots fan and a huge Tom Brady fan. So I'm also now a huge Tampa Bay Buccaneer fan, and I watch Good Morning Football every morning. I, I, it's going to be such a strange season if if it even happens at all. You know. Yeah, and I tell you, if uh, I think it will be a real fascinating test, and it will it will be meaningful for time. If Tom Brady can pull Tampa Bay out, it's going to say a lot about the leadership of that position. And um, 
I find it very intriguing. So I'm, I'm on board, man. I, I'm, I'm, a. I'm not going to wear my Hernandez uh, Patriots jersey anymore. So, so um, I hope I hope you're not just buttering me up because I'm the uh, the host of the of the podcast here. Yeah, I'm buttering you all the time. That's how I do it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, uh, regardless, I really hope the season starts, and I really hope we get some football this year. I'm I'm wondering how Cam's going to do. I know. I know it. Yeah, it, it, there's, it, it's, I'm, I'm really excited to see if, uh, if the Patriots affect what kind of effect it does have on him. Yeah, is it a bottom-up push or a top-down push, you know, how that's going to uh, interact? There's no doubt that the guy, if he's playing at his level, he's going to be awesome. Yeah, so. yeah, it'll be fun. And hopefully you, you guys don't burn anything down at a federal <laughs> building. We're going for worse. A couple more things before we get to the to the meat of our conversation, which is why I wanted to have uh, have uh, Bruce back on. A couple things. So uh, Bruce's TCU. Uh, I went to Johns Hopkins. Uh, the logo here on my shirt is the uh, the the mascot for the Hopkins lacrosse team. I played lacrosse at Hopkins, so no. I figured I had to step up my game with the uh, with the D one versus D one shirts here. Yeah. We have a frog on ours, so uh, a horny frog good. or a horn frog. Sexy. Yeah, you know what's interesting? You don't see horn frogs around here. When I growing up out in West Texas, you could pick them up, and we would stick them in coffee cans, and we'd play with them. Uh, they were everywhere, but they're very. Uh, it's they're rare now, but uh, anyway. So I tell these horn frog students, you don't know what a horn frog is. <laughs> And look at you going from uh, from West Texas all the way to uh, Islamabad, Pakistan. At the end of it all, what a, what a trip it's been! You know, in uh, Islamabad, in Pakistan, is far more civilized than West Texas. <laughs> well, we're we're definitely going to get into that in a second. So, a uh, couple things in terms of uh, uh, the studio may may look a little bit different here. Uh, I point your attention to my new logo on the mic. Here, uh, my friend Chassie Bell uh, hooked me up with the new logo. She is a uh, professional design and branding uh, uh, person, and her, mm. uh, her website is chassiebelldesign.com. She's awesome. I got the stars and stripes behind me because I'm waiting for my big banner with the new logo. So soon enough, uh, Rain Man's Take will have jumped up a little bit. Well, Chassie, I've had limited interaction with her, but she's a wonderful person. Um, a brilliant mind and you kind of gravitate. Well, some of us gravitate towards those kind of minds, but um, the flag looks good, man. I think you should be in the back of a ship, like a captain's cabin. You're cruising with the, the sails that are flying, you know, and uh, you're about to do whatever pirates do. <laughs> I love we'll it. Get I love into it. All right, here we go. A segue into, uh, into defending our great, uh, our great flag and our great country. So last time uh, when we finished off last week, Jojo, we were talking about uh, you guys pushing up into Baghdad for the initial invasion. So yep. I know that there was a couple things that we didn't get to because we ran out of time. So why don't you go ahead and kind of, there was a couple of events in particular that you wanted to touch on about that particular deployment. And then from there, we'll start stepping it up into to the, your, to your, uh, your deployments after that. Well, one of the things I'd like to reach back to is I, 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 uh, I want to talk about uh, Steve Haywood, Woodman. I, I think I might have said some things that were, I hope they weren't offensive, but I loved that guy. But, uh, you know, just like you being a freshman on a lacrosse uh, squad, he was the big brother and he was not an easy big brother, but he was a gentleman and I uh, had a real wonderful mind. And I learned some really great lessons from him in the cockpit, even though I didn't like flying with him, you know, uh, but, I, but a wonderful guy and consider him, him a dear friend. And uh, he was a wonderful CO um, because he had a warfighter's mentality. And I found that interesting. And I still think of some times, like I remember going into the, uh, the Delta T, uh, 29 Palms, trying to rush into the objective. And he told me, he said, only fools rush in, slow down, learn what is going on, learn, you know, particularly friendly 
You know, you want to know the friendly enemy and the position of the target on that nine line. The rest oh, hold on. Stop. stop. Did he give you an Elvis quote? He did. In terms of combat training? Yes. That guy's a yes. renaissance. Man. Right. Dude, you know how it is, man. Rushing in. Uh, the, you're going into where the alligator is there in the Delta T area, you know, that, that thing. And uh, I'm like, okay. You know, but you always feel like when you're getting to the objective, you want to – you want to demonstrate that you can, you've got the nine line, you're ready to deliver and go. It's a lot harder work than that. So um, anyway, so I was fortunate to work for him uh, whenever we went into Iraq during the invasion. And uh, I've got a couple of notes. I mentioned uh, the Trail of Tears, the Palm Grove, and the cow got loose. But um, I don't think what people understand is how much shooting we did in the early days just it, it was uh, unbelievable like you could do five sorties six sorties in a day maybe you're not shooting but once you get get going it might be that you're on you're going winchester uh and uh you're going back to get more ordnance and you know so if you if you go winchester you have to land reload you got about an hour and a half there in that space i mean a day can go by pretty quickly hold on hold on real quick so for everybody out there, Winchester means you shoot all of your rounds. So you are empty. So you got to return back to wherever it was to pick up more ammo and then head back out into the fight. Yeah, and so we would land on the road and we would have trucks on the road. So just land on the road, get an intel update, uh, reload, uh, get gas, and then go again. And uh, we'd work for a guy, I can't remember uh, the Ford Air Controller's uh, call sign, but he called us in on, um, a, a compound, if you will. And he said, we've got like a platoon plus size element in there. And so uh, it was uh, four snakes online, unloaded ordnance, um, probably mm, 12 to 15 uh, PGMs, because we wanted to keep some for uh, anything else. All the rockets that we could, all the 20 millimeter that we could. And then we went back to get gas and um, come back to support that mission again, or you know, uh, get on that target. Uh, and we talked to the Ford Air Controller. Said uh, it's a trail of tears. We we had just pretty much uh, we prosecuted a platoon size plus element uh, there, and we're thinking, hmm, that's that's a significant uh, chunk of meat, you know. Yeah. And then that same day. Uh, we went on to hit, uh, so with that ordinance that we reloaded, we got called in on a palm grove. And I found that interesting because, you know, as we were growing up as pilots, uh, you, you always have a target, like it's a, a tank hulk or something like that, small. But, and we talk about aerial weapons, like a rocket is an aerial weapon, unless nowadays with the, uh, I forget what they call it. It's a precision guided rocket, uh, APWK advanced. I, I'll think about it in a minute. Anyway, uh, we were called in on this palm grove and probably a good acre and a half in size. And um, we just got online. We called it out just like you do in a brief. And so you're going to take this, you're going to take this, we're going to take the middle, and boom, boom, boom. And we hit it all with the non-precision weapons, um, area weapons, 20 rockets, 2.75. And the fascinating part was, I thought the palms were just gonna fall like that. They didn't, they went like this, and they landed there, and then they fell. And we, we carved that place up uh, pretty well. Uh, the dudes had concealment, but not cover. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, obviously the fact told you hey there's a bunch of people in this pod yeah, no they they pid'd them and yeah. uh, and called us in otherwise we would never uh attempt yeah. to uh to go in on a target like that but uh they they were very clear they saw them uh, egress and what had been happening as when the convoys were going north uh these guys would fall into these concealed areas and when they would see um, elements of a convoy that were not infantry, they would fall in on them and ambush them. 
So that seemed to be a pattern that they established very quickly. And so what we try to do is, uh, is mop that up. But that was in the same day. And the third target on the same day was a house that, uh, a big house with a big yard with some livestock in it. And uh, this is what makes me laugh because we're hitting this house. If you look out to your left, there are civilians that are holding babies and standing there just watching, just kind of like, like it's a fireworks show. And uh, anyway, uh, I think humor in combat is something that you have to recognize. And you, you know that, I mean, uh, very well. Where it's you, very fatalistic and some would say sick, but it is, it's it a is. way to cope. Well, yeah, you know, and it's kind of funny when it pops up. So um, we're hitting this house hard. Uh, we have a rocket that knuckleballs. You know, you get that external ballistic uh, factor where you get tip up on a rocket, and the rocket might go just errant. And it hits this mud fence, and it opens it up, and that cow was staked down, and she wasn't having any more of it because it was loud. And uh, she pulled away and uh, ran out the – uh, that that hole that it, we created yeah. in that in that yard, and over the radio, Dave Bustle, and you know how dry he is, yeah. says, "Oh man, that dude is going to be mad." And we started laughing. He's like, "His cow got away. Like we just we just ruined the house, you know." That, uh, and, but yeah, and so we laughed about that and laughed about it. And Dave has a wonderful personality, though. Uh, he's very serious. We all know that. So, but uh, yeah, I think about that. It was, uh, it was, I guess, uh, kind of the balancing of the humanity in the in the act of uh, of engaging something like that. Well, I mean, it's it's again that 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 that's actually, and that's probably we could even have another interview about that is is those situations are so intense and so yeah your focus you are it, it's and and to be able to compartmentalize everything and then to drop something like a humorous comment into that into that environment is it is it's funny in the sense that it's so it's so opposite of what is happening right there the whole idea of compartmentalization it's just it's that's amazing it is and uh and yeah it's, it's fascinating because um we laughed over that for days um and you know on that same day so this is one day um we we're over the these grassy fields trying to mop up guys um you were so low that the grass was waving it was tall yeah. tall grass and you get into optics, and I recall getting on a target, um, and these guys were stripping down, and um, I could see them closely, you know, trying to lay down their weapons, or they did lay down their weapons. And um, the, uh, like I said, the grass waving, but one of the dudes urinating on himself. Literally, he knew it was about to come down, and we had to make a decision, are we going to do this or are we not? Yeah, I mean, clearly they had they had met the conditions for the ROE, and um, like, and I think about that guy uh, almost every day. I wonder, what did you do with your life after this? Oh, because you guys did not engage. We did not engage because they were giving up. They were basically gave up. Yeah, and so it was. Uh, you know, what is what it? What did you do later on? Yeah. And, uh, I wonder about that, and uh, I, uh, I find that interesting. So those are the things I think about on that uh, 2003 uh, invasion engagement. Uh, and I'm, I'm looking at my notes here. Um, Did you, don't worry about it. Um, so, you know, the thing is, is once we finished the invasion, or what we thought we finished, and once we got into, uh, into Baghdad, um, I thought we'd had pretty much wrapped it up and that all the other folks that knew what they were doing were going to handle it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so uh, it was surprising to me that uh, that job was not done. <laughs> we just kind of stirred up an ant's nest. And, and, and I think, it, it, well, obviously hindsight's twenty twenty, but obviously there was a lot of things right at that transitional period 
that could have been done a lot better, obviously. But, um, yeah, and, 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 uh, even the folks that were experienced uh, understood really how that was. I mean, we never, I mean, think about it. We didn't do it in Vietnam. Right. Um, we, yeah. it, we had 30 years of not getting it right. So. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, that, and that was, if you remember back, the original uh, Persian Gulf War in 91, that was, they, they explicitly said, we do not want regime change. So we're going to kick him out of Kuwait and that's it. Mm -hmm. Whereas this time we went in and kicked him out of Iraq, but then, you know, and again. Well, uh, I, I wanted to do about kind of our approach into Afghanistan and uh, how that impacted our decision making and certainly Donald Rumsfeld. Um, I can't speak for him, but uh, uh, he definitely had an opinion. Uh, and so, yeah, it shaped the way we, we conducted that invasion. And I think we did a good job. We, we, we did what we were tasked with. Exactly, yeah. And yeah. so. Yeah. But, I mean, and, and you know what? And that's, that's, a, that's the other thing about, you know, frontline combat is, you know, you're given, a, you're given a mission, and really you have zero control over how that impacts the bigger picture. And yeah. so, you know, you, you, yeah. Well, one thing I would like to add on that is uh, I think professional militaries operate differently than these savage forces. Um, I cared about every dang Iraqi civilian that would pass. And I know that most of us did, and that's the way we approached it. It's like, you know, these people are suffering under uh, tyranny, and um, I think that that is that's the way to do it if you can, if you've got enough money. So. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. One one last thing, and then and then we'll push on because we definitely got a lot more to to uh, to cover. Uh, when you were bringing up that that cow story, uh, kind of a similar situation. We were over there in '04. Uh, our tactics when we first got there was low and fast, mm -hmm. and uh, we get a call in the middle of the night, and we were pushing as fast as we can into back or into Fallujah, and you're going over farms and. And you could see people that actually it was so hot out there that they would sleep on the roofs at night. And so you go whipping over a house at 50 feet. People are on the, on the roofs. They're freaking out. And I'll never forget seeing the, this, one, this one cow was, was strapped to a, a pole in this family's yard. And he freaked out. And uh, last I saw was he, his, he started running. And then, you know, the chain snaps and he falls over. And I remember, and this is how crazy it was, I remember feeling more sorry for that cow than I did about the people that we just probably trashed their house because two helicopters, especially the old helicopters that we flew, yeah. flying that low and that fast is like a small earthquake when you go over a, a, a house that low, so. Yeah, I, I think you're right. It's a, it's a tricky business, but you know the, uh, the part that I find most intriguing and the one that I struggle with most is how you wanted the best for that population, for those people, yeah. and these assumptions that were probably, you know, uh, wrong, but you want the best for them, you know? And, and, and you know what, my, my personal opinion about that, Jojo, is as Americans, we are so lucky to live in America. You just want that for everybody, you know? Yeah. It, it just, and so, yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a tough spot to be in because you see, and and we've traveled together. I mean, we've been in in Egypt together. We've been in Cairo. We've been in Vietnam. I mean, you Dakota, see, uh, Laos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you see real destitution, and uh, yeah, it, it's a it's a it was a, a very interesting interesting experience for sure. Yeah, it's it's a toughie because you just. I, one of the things I want to talk about, if we can get to it, is uh, about the uh, different phases in a combat environment and, uh, you know, working the ladder. I, that's what that's what the guys at 169 call it, you know, the ladder. You're on the ladder. You're on tick response. You're going to be medevac response. You're going to be on a standby. You've got uh, JTAR. Uh, yeah. you know, and those dudes just get burned out every single day. You don't know what you're going to get. Right. Um, I find that to be, uh, I found that to be 
intriguing. And it's tough being a, a field grade officer, having to get back into a, a squadron and trying to learn how to play Xbox. <laughs> with all the young, with all the young lieutenants. Good guys to love those guys. I was always thrilled to get to fly with them. Just it was the best, you know, they didn't know what they were getting. Yeah. yeah. I love it. I love it. All right, brother, let's do this. Let's, uh, so, so you finish up the invasion and when did you, when did you return home from there? And then what did you do when you got back to States? So when I returned home, so the invasion, I think it was, um, <clears throat> it was July when I got home and, uh, July of 2003 after the invasion. And, uh, I got orders to the expeditionary strike group, ESG, ESG three. I was a plank owner there. We stood it up. People don't understand this in the Marine Corps community. Uh, there will be many that argue with me, but, uh, I, I can stand my ground on this. Um, we used to go out with an arm of a big, a big deck, amphib, and two small boys, three ships. Hold on, hold on real quick. ARG, Amphibious Ready Group for everybody out. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, Which is a smaller version of the carrier strike group that the Navy goes out with. Or an augment to it, I guess. Different, but uh, anyway, the thing is, is that when we added, we wanted to add power projection, and so we added um, a cruiser and a destroyer, and then we tethered, um, uh, you know, a stub, which you can't really tether a sub. I don't care what anybody says. They do their own testing. You don't get it. So, uh, so, but, you know, there was controversy because um, within the old uh, Marine Expeditionary Unit structure, we had a supported and supporting um, relationship between uh, a, a Navy 06 and the Marine 06. Well, guys didn't like it whenever we shifted this and we went to uh, a one star in, in control of these things, but it has to be, it has to be that way. You, your structure just broadened out so much that uh, it, you can't keep it in a 206 place. And I, and I know there are a bunch of new commanders that would love to slap me right now and they can come over here and I'll, I'll get them a cup of coffee and we can do it. <laughs> so, so talk to me about that. What was, what was, so you were there for when we, you were at ESG for, for when were you there and would you guys, what were you setting up to do? Uh, we were setting up to go back to the Middle East. Okay. And this was getting ready to, to, to set up the next phase of that, which is where I, I checked in in 04. So yeah, you were, okay. So window, I think in that window there was, uh, I wouldn't call it an operational pause. I would call it a period of uh, operational understanding, you know, trying to figure out what the, because the, the environment was changing. Yeah. When, when it, it had changed, when you got there, it wasn't the same Iraq exactly. or yeah. Afghanistan that it was. And, and so we were just trying to figure out how to structure uh, these elements. Uh, and there's another piece of that that has to do with um, kind of the finance of war fighting. If you can get more power projection out of the assets that you have, that's a big deal. Um, so, you know, if, if you can bring on uh, um, a cruiser destroyer that brings t land missiles, that have a thousand miles uh, reach, you've got some operational uh, influence that you might not otherwise have with a ready group. Yeah. Um, uh, so just interesting stuff. I learned a lot about that, but because our, our staff was, it was Navy and Marine combined. You got to learn to love the people you're sitting next to, regardless of what uniform they're wearing. And, um, you know, and then getting on the ship, seeing how hard those guys work, uh, we trash talk. We do. Uh, uh, Marines are not understanding of how hard it is to run a ship. To run a ship with, uh, you know, 2,000 people or 1,500 people and do it every single day. And uh, we talk about rust pickers and stuff like that. I mean, it's not fun, but they yeah, do and, it. And, and I don't know what it's like now because I've been out of the Marine Corps for 14 years. But back when, when we were in, it was tough to be woke. Yeah. Yeah, it was very tough to be woke. You had to have uh, you had to have a hard shell on you all the time. And <laughs> you'll do, but you know the, the the nice thing was is uh, the guy that took over ESG three who started it was uh, Colonel Medina, and uh, he was a gentleman. 
And I mean that in the best way. And he would tell us when we would start to fuss, don't get in the mud, mud with a pig. You're just going to get muddy. And that was the approach that we took. And he also told the Marines, said, you're going to have to work harder and learn more about this structure because their expectation is that you're not going to. And you're going to drive and learn and learn what it is to, to, to be on a ship and how the Navy uh, does their business. So, yeah, good things. I, um, I, there are things that I learned that most Marines don't. Uh, for example, um, you know how difficult it is for underway replenishing. Refueling, that's a good one too. Um, a ship has to, they look at the salinization of the water, the coolness of the water, the terrain, and how that affects their noise signature because it's a dangerous time to uh, refuel. It's stuff like that that I learned uh, with those guys. And uh, yeah, I really appreciated it. And, and, and you know what? And, and man, you can wrap that into what's going on in today's world is, you know, you, you, you start off, you know, maybe busting a community's chops. Then you actually live in that community. You realize that, Hey, these guys actually, it's a pretty important job and they know what they're doing. So there's a respect that's gained and that's, that's a good thing. Unless it's Fort Worth or Dallas, which they're a bunch of losers. I'm teasing. I love, I love going to Dallas. Um, <laughs> Yeah, that was a great experience. And then uh, I was able to take a break from that. Uh, I, midway through a deployment, um, I got orders to go to command and staff. And uh, I will say this. Now, hold on real quick. That's one of the top level Marine Corps schools for, for field grade officers. Yeah. And where is that located? This was in uh, Quantico. I went okay. to the Marine School because I didn't qualify. Virginia, just outside of D.C. Got it. Okay. Here's the beautiful thing about that, just as you mentioned that. We had wonderful lectures, wonderful lectures. I, I had a lecture on the Federalist Papers from uh, Justice Scalia. Scalia. Wow. Yeah, that ain't bad. Yeah, the, and uh, the staff, the way they structure it is there's 200 and something students, but you have uh, these conference groups, 12 to 15 people. And, um, but you have a, a PhD at the table and you have a, a field grade, or not like a 06 at the table. And, and they, kind of, they kind of run the way the structure of that uh, discussion yeah. goes and you have tons of resources. I mean, you get a banana box full of books and it's not, you don't have to read them all. It's like read, read chapter one, chapter six, yeah. 10 pages of this, I did, you know, and then, but, and you recycle that uh, throughout the course of the year. But that was a wonderful time, and it gave me a chance to, um, to kind of back off. Uh, and I took orders in that. Hey, hold on, hold on real quick, Jimmy, before you, before you push. So that level of schooling in the military, would that be considered like getting a master's in like political science in the civilian world? Or what, what, what would that equate to in the civilian world? Uh, it would be uh, like a, a master's in national security. Um, gotcha. In the Marines, I would I would criticize the Marines because we call it an MMS, Masters of Military Studies. Yeah. And if you try to pitch that to uh, civilians, they're like, "What? That sucks!" Like you're going to shoot an M16 or something. Yeah. You know the Navy guys they go to the the War College and it's a uh, National Security Studies. Uh, yeah. Gotcha. But, yeah. It, it it's interesting. I didn't know anything about the the interagency cooperation. I had no idea. I couldn't tell you at that point the difference between the FBI and the CIA. But you know, you get those classmates in and, uh, and actually I worked with them in Afghanistan, um, all these different agencies and you just you get an understanding. So yeah, kind of interesting stuff. But uh, I love that that I think that's the highest or that's the best education I ever received. Um, yeah, I bet. What you know, uh, for you personally, what was that like to go out of the desert fighting? to, you know, work, you know, classroom work. And, you know, was that, was that a tough transition or were you excited about it? What was, your, what was your take on that? Well, I will say this. Typical Marine Corps fashion, they said this is an education uh, environment and you're, you know, we're gonna give you a pause. Uh, then it was, hey, we're going to have a formation and we're going to run a PFT. So, <laughs> you know, the old dog can't get off the, <laughs> stop its tricks. 
But I love it. Yeah, it was wonderful. Um, I, it, learned, it taught me to think at a level that uh, I wasn't accustomed to. And it's not that my mind wasn't good enough. It's that I, I didn't have those, I didn't apply those processes. And uh, they, yeah, it's a wonderful school. And I, we read so much. I, I, it was the best academic experience of my life. And I've gone to some decent schools. So uh, No offense to TCU. Yeah, no offense. We can, well, we're going on that pathway. I have, I have conversations. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Awesome. All right, man. So, all right, finish up with that school, and then it's then then where do you go? I go back to uh, Camp Pendleton. I thought that they were going to stick me up in uh, headquarters or something like that. So I was I was very much ready for that. Yeah. And then I talked to uh, the monitor, and he said, "What do you want to do?" And I'm like, "What are my options?" He said, "You want to go back to Mac 39?" I'm like, "Oh yeah, I do." <laughs> you know what it means? Like, yeah, I want to get back into the gun squadron and go. Yeah. And I get to Mag 39, and you know this well because uh, this was 2005, and you guys had already been. I mean, you, you double pumped uh, 773, yeah, and, and wore those guys out. They were really struggling to uh, staff the war in uh, Iraq. We kind of let down Afghanistan a little bit. So uh, I went to MAG-39 because they, they put me on the billet to go to MAG-16. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. I didn't want to go to MAG-16. Who wants to go to an assault MAG, right? And, and by the way, MAG-16 is on the East Coast. So no, they're, they're West Coast guys. Oh, they are? Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, gotcha. I'm sorry. Sorry. No, no, my bad. Uh, and so I was like, I don't want to do this. Well, guess what? We, we put it. Two Harrier guys, an F-18 guy, uh, two Skid guys, a Huey guy, a Cobra guy, and I'm trying to think. So we, uh, they're like, we ponied up a lot, you know, between the mags, and uh, I thought it wouldn't be a great experience because that's just the way our communities were, the way you and I grew up. Uh, and if you heard uh, some of the guys at, the, at Mag 16, they're like, we hate going to Pendleton. We hate going to Pendleton. We hate going to Skid Row. Because those guys are just bona fide jerks. That is the truth. <laughs> so, and so real quick, let's uh, let's caveat that. So, Mag sixteen is primarily uh, F eighteen guys. So, there's, well, is that they, right? F 18s and C one thirties. No, it was uh, uh, 46s, 53s, and then Mag eleven was there with uh, the uh, F eighteens. Gotcha. Okay. We plucked some guys out of uh, Yuma, but. It was all this hodgepodge of, of guys that uh, wanted to be in the cockpit, yeah. but you're a staff, you're a staff guy. But, yeah, and, uh, but you're know, really good dudes. Uh, in fact, uh, I'll give a, a, a tell a story. I don't know if this is appropriate for webcast, but uh, you know Yoda, West Bank? Yeah. So Yoda kept getting uh, all these care packages from uh, Trader Joe's. And uh, anyway, we started trash talking. I said, dude, what's up with that? He said, well, my dad works at Trader Joe's. And we're like, is he like, does he sack groceries or something? And um, like now he's the CEO. <laughs> so just, just kind of funny stuff. So uh, yeah. those are the things that sustain you uh, in that environment, just to, that bullshit that, uh, you, you know. know. It, it's funny that you mentioned that because uh, when we were in Iraq, uh, Trigger Pace. Yeah. Um, his, uh, his brother at the time was an executive at, at Starbucks. And so we would get these care packages that were like, the, we had coffee makers, we had biscotti, we had yeah. Starbucks coffee. So our tent in Iraq was the place to be for, for coffee. Yeah, I believe it. You guys, uh, reserve dudes, for sure. Uh, the, I forget the number of the unit, but the great, the great geese, the great gooses, or uh, 46 squad and the reserve guys, those guys were, uh, they were totally hooked up. And uh, you could go by there, you know, if you're, you think you're going to be like, oh, I'm an I'm a active duty guy, I'm a, you know, these yeah. reserve dudes. Ah, go there, you, they got a popcorn machine. They've got all, <laughs> they get so much stuff. It is the best, you know, and the really good dudes. And uh, 
I love being around those guys. And you know, you can always depend on them. Uh, uh, on a mission, they, they could hit the timeline. Um, but you know what the different thing was uh, with those guys is they wouldn't just take any slot mission. They knew when to say no. Yeah. And guys like me, that yeah. we'd just settle up and go, you know, but they had maturity. But uh, yeah, it's interesting. That time, uh, and going back to you, uh, that was a tough time when the insurgency was starting to build. Because yeah. you, know, you, you actually went, you went back over in 06, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. so we were there for 04 and 05, and you, you checked in right when it was, that was at the height of the chaos over there. It was deep, deeply dark. It was, uh, it was something that you couldn't shake uh, in terms of, uh, it's hard to comprehend uh, the nastiness of, of human behavior at that time. Um, and you couldn't really, I, guys worked so damn hard. And you know what, as a Huey guy, you do a, a, oh, an escort mission or something like that. Uh, your, your crew chiefs are just looking out. They're looking out like crazy. They see everything. They'll see a trash bag that wasn't there, you know, uh, a few days ago. And it, it's hard work. And I, I, uh, I put that in my notes, you know, I, the dry hole and the, it, it, those dudes work so hard and, and you go out four or five hours in a day and not see anything. And then the next day things just explode. And, uh, it, and you do that day in and day out. You just don't get a sense of, you don't get a sense of satisfaction unless you're getting the target. And, um, you know, in the PID process and all that stuff was pretty slow unless somebody's going to raise a weapon at you. Right. Yeah. I mean, you had to go relay it back via uh, whatever net you were on and had to wait for somebody to put a flash diagram down and target's gone. Yeah. Well, uh, before we get into uh, the, the next question I wanted to ask you, what was your take uh, going from the invasion, which was basically all guns are off safe, it's shooting at everything, to 06 when you're there, it's more of a – kind of a policing type environment where you actually almost you've got to be shot at before you can do anything and get, get positive ID like you're talking about. What, how did you feel about how that had changed? Well, I, I felt that uh, in the, the window that I had been absent from that environment that I had a lot of catching up to do. Gotcha. Uh, and, and like I was saying, flying with some of these young guys uh, that uh, I want to pause this piece right here and not the tape, but uh, I flew with guys. I went to a weapons and tactics conference with three captains uh, out of 169. And um, we were staying at the diplomat hotel in Bahrain. And uh, they told me, they said, sir, is this what a, a port call is? And I'm like, what are you talking about? Uh, like we, since they were lieutenants, all they did was deploy to the desert. They'd never been on a port call. They'd never experienced anything like that. And so um, I was surprised when I flew with these guys, how um, they were just talented. They were so good. And um, it made me feel like, you know, our community is, is doing good, but uh, um, I don't know, the war had changed. It had changed and it was a lot tougher uh, in terms of engaging the target. They had all the skill in the world, but they just had to make a lot more judgment calls. Yeah, I believe. So yeah, interesting. Hey, yeah, real quick, the, uh, what you just mentioned about those young captains, the one thing that I found fascinating was, um, you know, our generation of pilots that had grown up kind of in the 90s and then started the war, uh, you get these young guys and that's all they knew was not only deploying to the desert, like you just said, but basically a combat zone. And that, that's all they knew, which is crazy. Yeah, and the other thing is that, I mean, some of these guys, I mean, you think about first lieutenants uh, out flying and, uh, you know, getting shot up. And, and that experience just, it, it was a wave. Those folks that were right on the cusp of the invasion. And uh, particularly, I think of 169 guys were a little bit, I won't say less mature, but the, the, the age difference was just a few months, right? Yeah. You know, 
teams. They didn't have enough time to really get wrapped up into the squadron and, and uh, qual up. Uh, and they, they just went and went. And um, I found it remarkable. And it was interesting to fly with them. And um, I, I just was so surprised at how talented they were, you know, given that I, I felt reasonably talented myself, you know. But, uh, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's cool. But, you know, I, I will put a pitch out there. There were a couple of those guys that they, they almost burned their careers. There were three – my dog, sorry. Three pump captains, right? And they, they had uh, – they had gotten in trouble for uh, getting a little liquored up and tipping over some Porter Johns. Yeah. Um, their careers, the, the, the Wayne CG, and I, I would love to uh, chat with him about this. Uh, I don't know who it was at the time, but uh, decided that he was going to terminate their careers. Yeah, and they, they did that over there in Iraq, in the combat zone. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. there were three pump dudes. and uh, Well, there were three pump on my time. There were two pump dudes at that point, but we would invested millions and millions and millions of dollars on these guys, and yeah. they were talented uh, pilots and, uh, and really good young men that just – um, a, a night that went a little crazy. They were leaving. They were leaving the zone. So you know, what are you going to do? Like, if yeah. all they've ever known as uh, young pilots is being, uh, you know, in a combat zone. So I, I don't like that. Um, I hated that. But I was, uh, I was flying with these dudes on their third pumps as captains, you know, and uh, got to learn a little bit about them and uh, just wonderful wonderful pilots and you know just anyway i'm yeah. i'll get to the middle yeah no i hear you i hear you all right so let's uh let's hit on so iraq 2006 uh specifically that was the time that we were hunting zarkawi so talk to me a little bit about that what were your what's your take on all of that it was uh probably in my military career the darkest time that i ever experienced um zarkawi was a nasty human being. Um, I think that Zarqawi actually influenced the war in Iraq uh, by virtue of the fact that he was so bad that it turned a lot of people away from the Al-Qaeda cause. I think he, he, he strayed from that. Yeah. But, um, we kept trying to get him, but what we were seeing is we would do, um, you know, going back to what we we're talking about, about getting on a target, we would do a lot of snap uh, vehicle checkpoints. We would do some things where we would just get land a, a, a Huey get some grunts out there and we would stop vehicles. Yep. And what we were finding was this sort of plague of kidnappings and murders. And it wasn't a war zone anymore. It was just, uh, it was a, a sick killing field. And um, we would always plan these missions because we were, because Zarkali was splitting over towards a muddy area. He would bleed into the West and then, he would come out to the east. And so, you know, you would target him here with the Marine assets and then uh, target him with other assets. Uh, when uh, there was intel that, you know, suggested he was out east. But um, I don't know. It was just a real uh, heavy, heavy, heavy feeling. And it's like, I, we want to get Zerkawi. And so you have a raid that's planned. And you're like, yeah, we're going to get him. You have all this optimism. And then you wake up to go see the, you know, that, the actions on the raid with the, uh, you know, the surveillance and everything. Dry hole, dry hole, dry yeah. hole. Nothing, nothing hits. And so... Uh, it was just one step ahead of the game, it seemed like. One huh? step ahead, man. You're right. You're totally right. And so, you know, it, and then uh, we were at the same time looking for uh, missing personnel. We were trying to hunt down, uh, you know, a journalist. Um, and uh, it was... It, you just it, it, hitting, you know, kicking it through the field goal, <laughs> which is hard to do. You know what I mean? And you relish the successes, but there were there were for every one success, there were twenty disappointments. And I think that uh, that really weighed on on me personally. And I, you know, going back to you know some of the air crew and stuff like that, uh, it weighed on them. And the IED fight was almost unmanageable in terms yeah. of getting your mind around it. Um, what's fascinating is MAG-16 had um, their, um, 
Yeah, sheep. I'm going to blank. Must be the beer in my Afghan uh, cub. There, uh, the flight surgeon was um, a psychiatrist. That's how thin we were. Yeah. Um, surgeons to support. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, it turned out that he was the best ever. The reason he was is that uh, we were using these 46s for Kazavak and uh, picking up these guys that were just mangled. They were mangled from IEDs. And uh, it wasn't the pilots that needed the flight surgeon. It was the, the, the crew chiefs and crewmen that- uh, yeah, They had to actually deal with the guys in the back, yeah. Deal with with all those, uh, those bodies. So yeah. I was say that's why 2006 for me in Iraq was a very uh, uh, dark time. But you know, to, um, to kind of characterize it a little bit more, one of the things that Al Qaeda did was they, uh, all the bakeries and stuff like that, they shut them down. They shut them down, and the people felt frightened because bread is such an important part of uh, of life in, in that culture. But yeah, it was it was not, um, you know, it wasn't an easy time, and I certainly was disappointed whenever the Air Force dropped bombs on him and got him. So uh, cheers to the Air Force, but not cheers to the Air Force because we won the game. It would have been interesting to uh, to to get a um, you know, to capture him and develop intel and, and understand the nature of that organization. But uh, he was operating outside of that. He he wasn't. Uh, he was on his own program. I, I mean, in, in a vacuum, that's inevitably what happens: is the thugs and the you know. I hate to say it, warlords, because he wasn't one, but those are the type of people that take over in a vacuum, you know, so. Yeah, and uh, I think it took a, a larger emotional toll on some of our young uh, troops than we realized, because it just was a dark cloud, you know, so what are you gonna do, right? Yeah, yeah, man. So, um, so what else, in terms of, uh, of 06, uh, so you get done with that deployment. So when did you go over? When did you go over in 06 and when did you get back? That 06 deployment was uh, um, a 10 month deployment for me. Uh, I'm trying to think when we went. I just know I came back in uh, like September or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I, no, actually it was August. I, I vividly remember being on a flight to uh, Germany and smelling the sweet grass once I got there and having my first beer. I was just <laughs> It will always be the best beer I ever had in my life. Yeah, really wonderful. But I could I could see uh, these little steeples from the churches that were covered by the trees, but the steeples steeples would pop out, and uh, the beer was wonderful. It took them forever to pour a goddamn beer. Oh my god! I mean, you eat this, boom! It's like, ooh, ooh. like I need. A, I need to it. You're about ready to go over the bar at the guy. Dude, that, that's funny that you said that because when we got back, when we left our after our second deployment, we uh, went from Kuwait to Shannon, Ireland. And uh, you, know, you leave Kuwait, it's nasty, hot, humid, brown, tan colors. And you wake oh, yeah. up and you're in Shannon, Ireland, and it's bright green and wet and beautiful. We, we got into the airport at the airport wasn't even open. We landed at like 6 a.m. And they had called in two bartenders to work the, uh, the, the bar in that part of the airport. And it was one of those, every, it seemed it almost like every unit went through there because there were unit patches all over this bar. Yeah. These guys worked their asses off for about an hour and a half pouring Guinness for all of us. And that, those are the best tasting Guinness of all time. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Uh, speaking of unit patches and God bless the Vipers, because uh, I augmented them for some time. Uh, when I was at uh, the FAC A school in uh, Coronado, Viper patches or stickers were in the urinals. Those dudes were just so, <laughs> that, you, they, I love them. They were so arrogant but, and it's a good organization, but like, you know what? You would stick a squadron sticker in a urinal and uh, actually, it makes me cry almost, I'm sorry. I love it. I love it. All right. So you get back 06 and then you, what I want to, what I want to touch on for the, for the next, for the remaining portion of the, of the conversation here is talk about your experiences in Bahrain and then your final one in Pakistan. So 
you get back in 06 and when did you head over and what were you doing in the interim before you went over to Bahrain? So I told you it was a, it was a, a 10 month deployment to uh, Iraq. Uh, it was supposed to be a year. I got offered the, uh, or, uh, the OPSO position. That was a big deal when you want to make Lieutenant Colonel to be an so, uh, so uh, at 267 and, uh, so my CO, uh, Colonel Close, was like, this is a good deal for you. We need to let you go and go do it. And I thank him for that, or I thank him. Uh, anyway, uh, I get there, I get started up there, and then um, I, uh, we were, so, all right, 267, for anybody that's a gun squadron dude, they were supporting 231st Mews a year. They were supporting the 13th Mew. They would always have one deployed and they were working up one and they had guys back. That is a huge challenge. That is a, that is a massive challenge. Yeah. Uh, so it was an interesting uh, position as an opso, but uh, the work was so hard that uh, I chose to uh, take a dead out <laughs> and go to Okinawa and go to 31st Mew. And uh, I got there, and they're like, we want you to be the opso. I'm like, I don't want to be an opso. You're going to be the opso. Boom. That's right, because you were destined to be in operations your entire life. I suck. I'm, I promise every, every in, anybody that knows me knows that I'm the worst ops guy ever. So, uh, yeah, so I did that. And then uh, Wheels contacted me, and he said, uh, you know, I got selected for uh, Lieutenant Colonel. I said, uh, we want you to go here. I'm like, I don't want to go to Marine Forces Korea. So, well, how about going to Bahrain? And Wills, you know him a hell of a lot better than I do. He's like, well, you know, you need to share the load with the force, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, like I've been deployed the whole time. And he's like, well, other people need to deploy. That's how Wills couches it. That's how he's, he's just that, that bright. So I took orders to Bahrain and it was an interesting tour, again, going back to the Navy. I had uh, that experience with ESG-3. I knew the Navy. Uh, it made all the sense in the world to me. Um, and, and that was a fascinating tour. Uh, Fifth Fleet, I was Landing Force uh, Operations Officer. I worked for a three-star. I was, there, there was one Colonel that kept the lights on who almost uh, NJP'd me years and years and years ago. but. Otherwise, I had very little interaction with him. Um, in fact, so, so this, so in Bahrain, you're it's a staff billet, right? You were you were actually working for yeah. the the admiral. The, yeah, uh, the three star at the gotcha. time, and uh, I was uh, and, and going back to this colonel. He was the one that forward, uh, so they kept the they kept the facility alive there, and. I felt like it was my duty to go in and introduce myself. He was looking down at papers and he's reading them. And then he looked at me and he said, holy shit. <laughs> it's you, Jojo. It's you. I thought I put you away those years ago. We struck up a friendship, but I was fortunate because I, you know, I was the only Lieutenant Colonel on the, on at Fifth Fleet. And uh, it was a, uh, it's pretty much a prize position because you can hide. Yeah. You know what I mean? You just do your thing. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, that their mission is really interesting. And you know what? Every day those guys were, it's not combat, but it's somewhere in between. And they play a political game. When you're talking about the, uh, the Arabian Gulf, the Straits of Hormuz, um, the Gulf of Aden, counter policy, and all that stuff, and uh, and when we would have a 1.5 presence with our carriers, so we would have one waiting out, one in the Gulf, the Mew would be in and around, and uh, every time a Mew would come in, uh, I would I would be their their man, their point of contact, right? Whether I was good at it or not, and they suffered uh, my incompetence. Um, but uh, yeah, it was fascinating. Uh, they, there was, a, there still is, and we're seeing more cat and mouse 
in the Raven Gulf with guys, uh, swarm attacks, stuff like that, trying to just like probe, trying to get a, it's yeah. just, just harassment, you know, like calling you in the middle of the night sort of thing, you know. Uh, and well, then, that, that shit's still going on right now. I mean, you, you saw the news that they, the Iranians put a mock-up carrier out in the streets of Hermuz and were attacking it. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and then, you know, we're protecting uh, Basra, the big uh, platforms out there. And then uh, the piracy fight was insane. And uh, anybody can look at, uh, look at uh, piracy uh, Horn of Africa 2005, and you're going to see probably a hundred and something attacks. Yeah. Insane. And they, uh, it worked out fine until the pirates got greedy. Yeah. So you would say, okay, I want 200,000 bucks. Yeah. Good to go. Yeah. But then when it got to be 10 million, 20 million, and it started getting crazy. And then what we found is that we were uh, having to respond to a lot of pirate attacks in the area. And, um, so, so Jimmy, this is, this is actually something that I didn't want to touch on. Cause I, it, so, that time period is when that movie Captain Philip came out with Tom Hanks about when yeah. the Navy SEALs rescued that guy. That's when the, the, the pirates were starting to get greedy. I don't fully understand why every single shipping company doesn't arm their boats with a, a squad of former military guys to kill those pirates when they come close. What is it in the maritime law that makes that acceptable? Well, I'm not a maritime lawyer, but I do know this. You can't pull into a port. You can have a certain amount of uh, defensive weapons, yeah. but you, you can't just pull into international ports with uh, being weaponized. Um, and we had looked at, not we, I have talked to a lot of guys that wanted to, uh, for services where, you pull out, you're going through the, the Gulf of Aden and uh, they're going to uh, get on board, uh, but you can't bring that stuff in. And so, and, and you know, they, they stretch wire around uh, these rails and, you know, like barbed wire and stuff like that. We've looked at non-lethal weapons. There's a host of things that just didn't prove to be um, successful. It, it didn't outmatch the desire of these desperate people from Somalia. That is the bottom line. That is my opinion. Yeah, it just, that, that, that still has never sat well with me because literally those pirates are running up to a huge tanker with these small little boats being like, hey, we got you, you know, yeah. give us money. Yeah, you know, and you look at their equipment, it's all bottom up, uh, yeah. approaches a hook, hook and ladder, boom, get up in there. <clears throat> there uh, but uh, the, these maritime uh, sailors are not, that's not their thing. And they know it's not their thing. And like, you know what, I'm not, I'm not going to deal with this. The company will pay for it. But if, if you go back, look at 2005, look at the records of uh, how many ships were seized by uh, pirates. It will, it will blow your mind. And um, the ransom that was paid, it's usually pretty low, like a couple hundred thousand. But when you start getting up to like a, 20 million bucks you're, you're going to bring on something else that's <laughs> and is that is that basically how it stopped it, i mean it's they stopped doing it because they're like the seals are coming or uh that's a tricky bit too okay we didn't have the capacity within the region to do uh an opposed boarding at night um we just didn't right because we had decimated our special operations force or, excuse me, had distributed them. Uh, in Iraq or Afghanistan. Yeah, yeah, those guys weren't available. And, uh, and it's hard because what people don't understand, so I, I went through a planning process with this. What do you need? Well, I need at least four aircraft. That means I need at least eight pilots. I need at least how many air crew I need to be able to maintain it. I need the facilities to maintain it. I need a force that we can uh, practice with all the time. And, uh, and you realize that you, you, you just, it's just so much. That's why the mule was- so, so it's more, it's more cost effective to just pay the little ransom and be done with it. The insurance companies paid the ransom, but once we got down to the heavy stuff, uh, it was more uh, just bring in the best guys you can get from the States. They can get in, they'll fly them in. They, those dudes are 
hard, heavy hitting guys that uh, they're they're ready to go. But you know, you can't be ready for every mission set. You got to be, but th but they're ready to do it because those things are uh, those are tricky ops. Um, but we used to be able to, I would say, to do uh, a medium risk sort of opposed boarding even at night, but. Uh, it, it takes a little bit more than that, the, the best dudes to do so, it. So let me ask you this from, from like a macro level. So Fifth Fleet, is, that's, their, that's their area of responsibility all over that part of the world where most of that piracy is taking place. Yeah. How, how, much, how much interaction do they have with those international shipping companies? Is there any interaction at all, or is it more just government to government? Hey, we need you to protect these guys, type of thing. What? How does that work? Uh, I don't know. I, I wish I could answer that. I, yeah, that doesn't that doesn't help our podcast, Jimmy? <laughs> no, I I think that you know there's some limited uh, contact, you know, uh, because sailors have a sailor thing that they do where they talk and all that. But uh, I don't. Uh, I I. Definitely think that there was some discussion uh, with these companies and what they're doing uh, that was at a level that I, I didn't understand. I, I eat chow. I, look, I surf the net and uh, I talked to Marines when they came in the country. That's it. So my, my, my vision of Bahrain is kind of like that. Uh, uh, the, uh, yeah. Casablanca movie, where it's like everybody from all over the world meets in one kind of area, and we have drinks, and we kind of talk, and there's spying going on, and is that is that about what it was like? Because because the entire world has operations in there because we were dealing with the Persian Gulf and that whole area. Well, I I will tell you this, and and people might disagree. Everybody spies. That is what you do. And it's not like you're on a deliberate uh, spying mission, but you collect information, you pass it along, yeah. and, uh, and that's how it goes. But uh, I don't think that uh, Bahrain is tricky. It's tight. It's a small island with less than a million people, and um, they have a really, really sophisticated uh, internal intelligence group. It's more of a police intelligence sort of thing. Uh, for us, we're just... We have real estate that we're leasing and we conduct these operations. But it's fascinating, you know, I worked on some projects where, with the, the Bahrainis where we wanted to upgrade their equipment and there were things like, well, we want life vests. I mean, life vests, we can do that all day long. You know, that, like, is that how we're going down this road? But yeah, yeah it, you, it's a hard, hard place to get into, but uh, I, I, found it to be very interesting. It was very uh, culturally diverse. Um, but that whole region is tricky and you, you don't break into it. Uh, so at this point, your, your sort of view is starting to expand. So you've been, yeah. in Iraq, you've been in Afghanistan, you've been down in the weeds, hooking and jabbing. Now you're starting to see the big picture. So now let's, so when did you leave Bahrain and what happened in between there and you going to Pakistan? Well, so I did the OPSO tour. I, I did a MU tour. In Bahrain. Right. And that yeah. was so 30, It was a 31st MU, but not a MU sock, because it's important. And I want to bring that up in the conversation because we didn't have force reconnaissance associated with this. So we couldn't do deep reconnaissance. So we, it, it stripped us of kind of the, uh, uh, that special operations capable uh, badge. Um, and that was my third MU. Um, and I'm not trying to degrade anything. I just think it's important for particularly folks like us that they understand um, that things have changed. And so we were feeding assets into uh, Iraq. And then we started seeing that things were bubbling up in uh, Afghanistan again and how we're going to support all that. But uh, so I went out and knew it was wonderful. I tell you, I, in fact, um, I, uh, I was just talking to Whitney about uh, us going to Okinawa, taking the trip. <laughs> I think they would, everybody would go crazy. Um, it would be a fun trip, by the way. 
we get up north, maybe do a little bit of snorkeling and diving. Uh, that would be good, right? Um, but, I, yeah, I've, I've, been, I've done a year over there. I, there are other places on Earth that I'd like to go see before that. Oh, uh, okay. Well, we'll do stuff that else. I think you would like it more. I really do. I, I, I probably would. We, we'd, we'd hook up with uh, Skeeter and Kay. It'd be awesome. Yeah. Is Skeeter up there? Well, so Kay is from Okinawa, or her family has a house in Okinawa. So he goes over there all the time. Dave Ratzel, I just talked to him. They're thinking about buying one. Yeah. We could do it. Anyway. Let's, we digress. So, Sorry, folks. That, that new deployment with, uh, I, and I tell you what, it's tough. I keep talking about being the new guy coming in. Yeah, being the new, uh, doing the, being the new major coming into uh, a squadron is not fun because yeah. everybody hates majors. It's the bottom line. It is a, a universal rule. Um, but, and you have to earn trust. So we went to Oki. We did a 31st Mew debt that was, that was uh, a very good debt. I took the guys. Um, I had 53 dudes on a detachment to uh, Thailand, and that is not a bad thing for 45 days. It doesn't hurt, right? It's a good thing. Oh, we, uh, it was the, oh, the Myanmar flood, and the, they, they didn't want us around. They yeah. wanted you know, they thought we were all going to collect intelligence. And anyway, so those dudes, we just had, we had a wonderful time in Thailand. We flew, we did, we just had a good time in Thailand. They were well behaved. Uh, it's remarkable because we only had one uh, Liberty incident and it wasn't a bad one. It was, I was late sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, but uh, anyway, so from there, um, I, I got orders and I requested them to one meth. I was addicted to war fighting. I was, I couldn't, I couldn't stop it. And uh, I got the, the job as the, um, the current operations officer. So every action that we had going on on the Marine side in Afghanistan, Iraq, and the things that we we're doing out in the Pacific came through my desk and I couldn't, it's not that I couldn't wait to get up and look at it. But that's the first thing I did every single morning, every casualty, everything. And I, uh, I, I just w wanted to be involved. Yeah. And, um, and that went on for some time. And then there was an opportunity to go to Pakistan. And I uh, was like, I want to do this. Yeah. This is the way I can get back in. And as a Lieutenant Colonel, I, I want to get back in, in the, in the game. Yeah, your, your, your trigger pulling days at that point are over. You just want to get into that environment. Yeah, totally. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. And so, uh, you know, my boss said, yeah, okay. I'm like, okay, it's one year orders to Pakistan. Hard to get into Pakistan though, uh, because they were very, very rigid about uh, their visa process and so forth. And so, but yeah, I was, uh, I just, couldn't get off of it. Yeah. And, 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 and let's, I want to, I want to touch on two things before we hop into the Pakistan specifically. What, what, what was that? I mean, pour beer into my uh, Afghan mug. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's take a break. Go, go for it. Grab one. You need to grab one. So, uh, all right, ready? Here we go. Three, two, one. So, yeah. Um, so a couple things. One, uh, so you, you're, I, it, it, it almost is like you're just, you just taking orders to get anywhere as close as you can to what's going on. Yeah, and uh, that is true. If I found that I love to operate um, individually as a, you know, independent. Uh, I, I didn't mind writing uh, reports and things like that, but I like to understand the environment and. Uh, and I, I think give feedback that is really solid back to the community, yeah. uh, as opposed to just um, this shallow opinion. Yeah. So, all right, so now you're ready to go over there. And what's your, when you first get there, I mean, what, what, what's your take on, on being in Pakistan and, and how that fits into the whole, the whole thing? I will say that I was lazy um, and I didn't uh, really do the work, you know, understanding kind of the, 
the nature of the way that region had changed. Uh, you know, uh, I, I had placed some catch up. Um, you know, Pakistan and India were, were a colony under, you know, Great Britain until 1947, and there was the partition. And the partition is very important to understand. Um, and so I didn't know that. I just was a dude that was going to roll into uh, a place and um, learn about it. But I wish I would have learned more. Um, I find it fascinating. And I, I was waiting so long to get in because the Pakistanis were very, very, very particular about who they let in, particularly a guy like me. They're not going to, you know, just slip in. Uh, but uh, so what was that vetting process like? I mean, obviously the, the U.S. government's like, this is one of our military officers. He's, what was that like? The vetting process took, I started it six months out. Yeah. And wow. uh, you know, the, 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 I wasn't, uh, they, I wasn't selling military equipment. So I, I belonged to a different bin of characters. And so there's like six of us. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they really, they were slow to let you come in and go. And they, we had several things that had happened. So um, the Bin Laden raid happened in uh, May, 2011, right? I wasn't there then. There was a hell of a lot of burn over that raid. And then uh, when I got there, they just had a, uh, the Salala, uh, shootings where coalition forces uh, killed, I don't, I thought it was 30, somewhere between 25 and 30 uh, Pakistani forces on the border. So uh, when I got in, uh, it wasn't a very um, receptive environment on the military side. Well, because because you had mentioned in, in pre-production that uh, one of uh, Bin Laden's wives actually lived in Islamabad, where you were where you were working. You know what's interesting on that is uh, you're going to laugh at this. I used to take we we I had like four different routes I would take into the embassy, but one of them took me by the park, and uh, there was a house that had a beautiful red roof, and we're so Islamabad. There is a lot of wealth there. Not raw pandy, not passion, any of those things. Uh, it's all about as a different animal. Uh, and I where does where that wealth come from? Is it just is it just corruption? Is it oil? Is it opium? What? Where's the what's the wealth? Probably corruption. Yeah. 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 That's uh, that's my opinion. There, there are people that are experts that can tell you otherwise, but that's what I'm taking to the uh, pancake house. Uh, you know what I mean? But so I, I would drive by this place and I always noticed it for its uh, stark roof or not stark. It was a, it's a bright red roof. Like it's interesting. Who would pick a red roof tile, like a glazed red roof. And uh, anyway, I see a picture with a, and I noticed that there were some guard huts that popped out there. Uh, and anyway, I saw a picture in the magazine or not the magazine newspaper, um, like, Oh, Bin Laden's wives living here they didn't have an address but it's the only house with a red roof and yeah. you know and, and so and, and i know this place you know because i know the, the way the street looks and everything yeah and it's fascinating and so the significance of that to me is that the community understood the intelligence community understood that bin laden was in the vicinity um, you know, 60 something kilometers just north over the hills. Right. And uh, the uh, Abbottabad. And I, uh, I had so much interaction with the uh, uh, Inter Service Intelligence Agency at Pakistan, not because they talked to me, it's because they listened to my phones. And I, I did talk to them on my phones, but like, why are you listening to me? I can hear children crying and stuff like that. Like, do seriously? It. Yeah. Is that, is that out in the open? Out in the open. That. Wow. And, yeah, and they kind so of, that's more like that Casablanca example I was referring to earlier. Yeah. I've never seen Casablanca. I'm going to. Oh, I'm going yeah. to do it this week. And we'll, I figure uh, a TCU alumni would have seen that already. I know. You know, uh, 
it's like Sports Illustrated and uh, like you know swimsuit stuff. I mean, that's what we do. So, so you're at, are you there by yourself? You're literally an individual augment to the. Are you at? Do you work at the the embassy or what was your what were you right. doing over there? So I was supported by the embassy. Gotcha. And I worked for RC Southwest, and then there was Regional Command West, and then RC East. So there were three officers and one kind of honcho on that deal. Uh, so there were four of us and um, we lived out there. We, um, we lived in different houses. We, I mean, we would move every few weeks or whatever. And uh, yeah, that was the thing. And what we did is we uh, coordinated with uh, the Pakistan military. And this is something I think that is uh, something many don't know. There's a border, the border, on the, you know, the Western uh, Pakistan border, it splits, it weaves between the international border and the Durand line. And um, the Durand line uh, was established, I've got notes, 1893. Um, and that's between the, Pakistan and India, correct? This is specifically, uh, what I'm talking about is uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Okay, gotcha. Sorry. Uh, because, uh, you know, it was, that area was uh, Hindustan before the partition in 1947. But in 1893, Durin was, Mortimer Durin was, you know, paving the way all around there, 1,500 miles of, of surveying. And so there are gaps between what Pakistan recognizes and what Afghanistan recognizes, and particularly in the, uh, the, the northern area on the FADA, uh, the federally administered tribal areas, where firefights go on in areas where nobody has claimed. Yeah. So it's like a schoolyard fight. You know, you're going to go out to the bridges or whatever. To, yeah. to, and uh, and that was one of the things that I dealt with. Um, and we we tried to enforce that. We tried to like we need to get a clear line and. and Afghanistan and Pakistan could not make an agreement on that. So those gaps, they just kept in place. And they were- And, 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 that, and you're talking, that's a conflict that is a hundred and, what's that? 100, 200 and, or 190 years old, something like, I mean, it's crazy. It's just- Well, it's, it's more- 130 think, years old, 100, 140, 140 years old. Yeah, I think it's morphed. I think that uh, it, we don't understand the, the nature of the conflict before, but I, I assure you that you know you get these Uzbeks, the Wasteria Sand people, uh, those folks on uh, Western Pakistan. They view themselves as more of a tribal people than somebody that has a sovereign leader. Yeah, yeah. and, uh, and uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, they've yet to be able to dig their feet in and make that happen. Yeah. And the tribal connections are just disruptive. Yeah. That's I, and I, it seems like that. to me that the only, like in our modern society where we accept the fact that nation states have borders, you would almost let those people kind of have at it, just quarrel amongst yourselves, except now there's nuclear weapons involved in that whole discussion. Ooh, that's a different one. We can't talk about it. Okay. That maybe uh, not that. Yeah, we can talk about it over a beer. And that right. someplace, right. but, uh, so I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to, uh, no, no, no. Uh, I'm too close on this topic. Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, so yeah. dude, talk to me, G give me, um, so in the final analysis of your time in Pakistan, I mean, what do you what do you think is, is what, do you, what 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 was your takeaway when you when you left there? I I think that I was uh, tired and uh, disappointed for the people, and I would say discouraged for the, of Pac for the people of Pakistan. Yeah, you know those they were, the people I met so many really wonderful people there. Um, and then I met some bad ones. Yeah. Some, uh, I, I mean, I met, uh, 
you know, guys that were, that just hated uh, anybody that wasn't Pakistani, but you know, they didn't have power. The military has power and that is the bottom line. There, there is a very sophisticated, uh, you know, political party system um, and, and they can mobilize people quickly um, to riot and do crazy things, but nobody has faith in the government. And, and people will say, Bruce, well, how do you know that? Because you had limited interaction with the Pakistani people. I did have interaction with uh, Pakistanis that work at the embassy. Um, and they're like, we have no faith in government. No faith in government. They love the military. And the military is in a really sweet spot because if the government fails, the military can come in, yeah. lift it back up, and then we'll get some stuff. And they said, we support democracy. But they've got it. Um, and the military has a, uh, it's a, it's like an organization. I mean, they, they have farms, they've got industrial complexes. And so it's a really fascinating thing. And you know what, here's the deal. You would think that I would have a, a bad taste with those guys, but I work with some of these dudes and they were brilliant. Um, the ones that I dealt with were top level dudes spoke better English than I do because I'm from Wink, Texas, um, all day long, you know. And most of those guys are probably educated in the West, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And it's interesting because their structure is so rigid that I would roll in, uh, no Pakistani general wants to talk to me. I'm carrying a suitcase for my boss. That's the way it is, right? Yeah. They will separate us. I would go have tea and uh, eat cucumber sandwiches. And uh, I would hobnob with the uh, 05 and 06 level people. And we would, I would call it sniffing. We would sniff one another yeah. because we needed one another. And then uh, I would reach back to them for a favor. And they needed a favor. And then those favors were communicated back and forth, you know, uh, to the higher levels. So, but I like them. They're all good dudes, but that, that is a system. And if you get a really talented uh, Pakistani officer, you know they're going, they're going to live on a compound when they retire. They're going to draw from the industrial state that they've created. And that is that's my perception. I could be wrong. And the, Before we leave, though, I want to talk about chow halls. Have had it, my brother. Where? Chow halls where? What part of the world? Oh, man. Where do you want to talk about it? Well, uh, I, uh, the chow hall that I had in Iraq was actually pretty good. Pretty damn good. Um, until that one F-18 did a low pass over the chow hall and people thought a bomb went off and everyone dove under the tables. I will tell you a good F-18 story. We were at 29 Palms. I don't remember what year it was. We had these restrictions on where we could fly. You couldn't fly over Camp Wilson. You remember that? Yeah. Well, uh, this F-18 just blew by there. I don't know if we went in burner or whatever, but it just like sonic boom, crazy. And uh, one of the guys, it might've been, might been Steve Lightfoot. I don't know. He said, uh, God, don't, you're not supposed to do that. And then, Pilot said, "I quit once. I can do it again." <laughs> that's the uh, that's the the reserves motto. Those dudes were the best. And the other one was, uh, we know how we would have codes for lasers and stuff like that. Uh, and so, hey, put the watermelon on or whatever. So, watermelon was a code for laser. And uh, so uh, we we're like spot on. And this guy, he was a cow he was a cowboy from uh, Fort Worth. And he said, give me a big old fat slice of that juicy watermelon. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, I tell you what, Jojo, this has been awesome, brother. I want to wrap up. Hellman Province, Camp Leatherneck has the best chow hall. Really? I've eaten it, all of them. I, I traveled around trying to get the best food in Afghanistan. Uh, Bastion was okay. IJC was okay. Sucked. What I made Helmand Province the best? Is that where the Air Force was? No, it's where the Marines were. Can you believe it? Oh, no, I cannot. 
No, it, it, yeah, you wouldn't believe it. I mean, you know why it was the best? Because it was normal. It wasn't like they were trying to do any good lettuce and tomatoes and uh, just regular food. Uh, they didn't try to go crazy. And uh, I think IJC, uh, in my record, and I've been in a lot of these chow halls, was the very, 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 very worst. And I can't say very many more times. <laughs> well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm going to throw in one more anecdote, and then I'm going to give you the final word. But okay. uh, so, 03, I'm in, I'm in the reserves, but we haven't been activated yet. So I'm still doing my day job of commercial real estate. One of the clients I had in Carlsbad was actually a ketchup company, if you can oh. believe that. And I do not remember the name, unfortunately. So I'm working a deal to help them find new office space. Yeah. And then our unit gets activated. So I go and talk to the, I, I think it was the CFO or the COO at the time of the, of the company. And I go up to talk to him and I said, hey, listen, I want to introduce you to the guy who's going to take over the account because I'm leaving. And when I, and this is an older guy, he's probably in his mid 60s. And when I told him what was happening, the guy literally teared up and stood up and gave me a big hug. And literally three months later, I'm in Iraq at the chow hall and the ketchup was supplied by that company. Oh, It was just kind of a smaller world, you know, small little world type of thing. So it was kind of cool. It is. And, you know, uh, I don't think that people understand how important it is to go get a good meal. And it doesn't have to be fancy, but it's like, it's what you do. And there's so much bullshit that goes on. And, uh, you know, that's the way you catch up. Uh, so you're going to catch up. Um, but uh, I was going to reach on a, a couple of things back to uh, Pakistan. I was privy to sit in on a lot of negotiations. I was a note-taking Son of a bitch. Uh, that's what I did. That's, you know, that was the, the job. You're literally a fly on the wall for some serious diplomacy going on. These guys did it differently. They would dismiss you and they could sort things out and they could say all the, the stuff they wanted to. And, and they were, <clears throat> they just sort of, they were very skilled at, at this. And the Pakistanis were, like I said, they, they talked to us. They chose to speak English. We had interpreters because they wanted to demonstrate that we're, we're on the same level here. Yeah. Um, but this was a time when, uh, after we had those, the Salala killing, um, not killings, but the, that attack, um, they were like, we're gonna cut off, you know, your ability to uh, move transport through the, the Southern line of communication. And so we're like, well, we can't, we need that because we were coming in from the north, right? And, um, and north and south, but we could use shipping to take us in from the south. Well, anyway, they're like, yeah, you can do it. $9,000 container. That's what they wanted. And it wasn't like, um, they knew that it was insulting. Yeah. But that's the number they pitched. So that's how this, uh, uh, that thing uh, went. And I watched these guys uh, work their way down. And, uh, you know, kind of our circular method was, all right, we're going to push more from the north. And then we will burn our, ourselves to death doing it with air to get in. So, we're, you know, we can play this game. And it was fascinating to watch, uh, uh, you know, that go on. Um, and the other thing was is we would talk a little bit about the border then we would get into some of these other things. And then it would be, um, what are you going to do about ammonium nitrate? Because that's what they're making bombs out of. Yeah. And then they're like, the farmers like ammonium nitrate. And, you know, so it was this sort of thing. And I'm, I'm looking at this, I'm witnessing it. I'm like, wow, this is uh, out of my pay grade. Uh, yeah. And, uh, you know, how are you going to hunt down these dudes? Like, well, we sent a platoon up to the mountains and we got 19 heads uh, that got sent back to us. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, just uh, wow. kind of, yeah, it was like, we're, we're doing our part, but you don't understand the, um, 
it, it's not as easy as you think. You don't just push a button and, and, uh, and, and sort it out. But that's what, you know, in Pakistan was crazy. And I would say the last thing is the, you know, like I said, ISI, they were everywhere. You couldn't go anywhere without. What is ISI? Uh, the uh, internal security, I say, and, and it's well, the, it's the secret police of Pakistan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, they they just they could put uh, in a day they could put fifty to a hundred guys on you. Really? Damn. Yeah. They just it, it was that cheap, and um, the good thing is, is it pays to be stupid. Well, uh, expound on that, Jimmy. Keep them on their heels. All of, all of, all of. Come across as it's the it's the uh, it's the uh, Columbo, uh routine. Yeah. Come across as stupid. Right. Exactly. Nice. Nice. Uh, let's see. Oh, and the last thing I was going to put up. Okay, so I live next to um, or adjacent to uh, the famous Marriott Hotel, the gut bomb. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, my neighbor got killed uh, by his. Uh, so, by, hold on, it got bombed while you were there. Nope, it okay. got bombed in two thousand nine. And okay. here's the funny thing: I was uh, I was supposed to be there a week before, um, and then uh, let's see, did I get into Chuck Yeager yet? No, you did not. All right, I was trying to get into uh, Pakistan, and I'm waiting for military lift. Couldn't get it, couldn't get it, and Chuck Yeager's there. Really? Yeah. And he must have been very close to him because he died shortly thereafter, right? I don't know. All I know was uh, he looked at me, and I had a uh, camis on with the wings and with wings, and uh, and pardon me, he said, "What the hell is a marine aviator doing here?" I said, "Sir, I'm trying to get uh, into." Pakistan. And he said, I'm going there right now. And I said, well, I'm, I've been trying. I've been trying for months to get in. And he said, well, I helped build the modern Pakistani Air Force. All no, those F-16s. I said, yeah, I did it, you know, years ago. I'm like, I can't believe it. And he came back a few days later. And hey, hey, Jimmy, hold that thought right there. I feel like I need to say this to everybody out there. So Chuck Yeager, if you don't know, was the first American to break the sound barrier. He was, he was the precursor test pilot up to the Mercury astronauts, up to the Apollo astronauts. He was a legend in the Air Force and in the space uh, operations of the United States. So Jimmy is talking, actually talking to a legend during this whole thing. So go. Yeah, we're trying to get into Pakistan, and uh, he's he's a celebrity there, and he gets a dang visa just by a virtual conversation. Yeah, he got you into Pakistan. I'm trying to get in. I'm trying to get in, and, and so we have a conversation about what I'm going to do there, and we have a conversation about building the, the Pakistani Air Force. And so I would go because we had a flight that would be scheduled, not because we only had a few flights that ever went in there when I was there, like four maybe. But they would play games with us. Um, so your flight schedule would come in, they would cancel it, cancel it, cancel it. And uh, so I'm waiting at IJC, and Chuck Yeager comes back through. And this is the brilliance of that guy. He said, Bruce, what the hell are you doing here? I said, hey, sir, I'm trying to, still trying to get in. That's, that was the conversation. And then you got in. Well, I got in a couple of days later, but, uh, you know, I – I was just uh, struck by my moment with Chuck Yeager. And you know what? He was, I couldn't believe that he remembered my name. And uh, I didn't break the sound barrier. I could definitely remember his name, though. Man, I tell you, that's, that's actually awesome because Chuck Yeager is a legend. Well, you think about those dudes getting in the airplanes and uh, they think they're going to die, perhaps. But they're like, you know what? I'm better than dying today. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, everybody out there, if you haven't read it or seen the movie, the right stuff, you'll, you'll know all about yeah. Chuck Yeager. So very yeah. cool, dude. 
That's I'm awesome. Gonna up with you. Yeah, I appreciate you uh, taking time with me. No, bro, this is awesome. So um, I tell you what, I feel like we could talk for hours. And uh, so let's come up with something else to talk about down the road. Well, we're going to have to uh, figure out that, you know, I know Mimi's chomping at the bit to get another trip scheduled, and uh, I don't know that Peru's going to hit. I'm hearing it's, uh, it's starting to uh, start to break down. The hotels are starting to cancel and all that. So, And then the places you and I want to go are just too crappy for anybody. So, uh, <laughs> I love it. I love it. All right, well, yeah. hopefully uh, Hopkins uh, will pop up and uh, we'll be having some uh, lacrosse pretty soon. I love it. Hey, so uh, real quick, let's do this. And, and obviously, I'll, I'll trim out some of that stuff. But uh, Bruce, great talking to you. Thank you very much for your time. And uh, if you were in the military, the police, the fire department, the first responders, if that's you out there, thank you very much for your service. Jojo, it's been a pleasure, my friend. I look forward to seeing you soon. Always, man. And I like the background, dude. You can't yeah. beat that. All right. All right, guys. It's the Rain Man. Take care. Thanks for watching Rain Man's Take, Observations on the World We Live In. If you like the content, don't forget to hit the subscribe button below. You can also follow Rain Man's Take on Instagram at Rain Man's Take. Also, check out our website at www.rainmanstakepodcast.com and send your comments to rainmanstake at gmail.com. Keep an eye out for future podcasts, which will be coming out every Thursday at 5 p.m. West Coast time.